We are here in the headquarter of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. It is not a historical room, but the name of the room is a very reference because it's the Helmut Schmidt room. Helmut Schmidt was also within the Social Democratic family had a difficult time as chancellor, I would say, but afterwards also, well, he was very much recognized for the Franco-German cooperation, for the, all what he did on European integration. And he was a little bit uh, the, more than a philosopher also to give us orientation, not later than by a really famous Congress of the SPD in 2011, where he made the speech, which still is a reference for us, which is in, with and for Europe, yeah, where is a, a light motif for progressives, for social democrats and socialists with in Europe, and in particular defining the place as Germans and as German social democrat. So I'm very happy to welcome this panel, which will be completed uh, at a later moment on behalf of Progressive Alliance. Progressive Alliance, which is the network, the cooperation platform of socialist, social democratic and progressive parties, actually 140 parties all over the world are part of this uh, working platform. On all continents we are present. But today we are here in Berlin because the party of European socialists is organizing a high level event on the future of Europe. And I think certainly with all panelists here around the table, we agree that if we speak on the future of Europe, we need to put the social question first and the question of the social cohesion, of the social progress, not only as a promise in election campaigns, but as a general DNA for progressives. I think this is the reason why we have come together. My pleasure is to welcome Laszlo Andor, the Secretary General of the Foundation of European Progressive Studies, former European Commissioner, and very active reflecting also on the, in particular on the purpose of today, the question of welfare and democracy. It's a pleasure also to welcome Esther Lynch, Deputy Secretary General of the European Trade Union Confederation. And with Esther, in former times, we were fighting together ahead of the famous Göteborg Summit for the European Pillar of Social Rights. And also Gabi Bischoff, who is the from MEP uh, from uh, SPD uh, in Berlin, um, with background from the trade union movement, with a long track record also in European questions because also you have been in the former convention, in the European Convention, already active, and you have been uh, president of the workers' group in the European Economic and Social Committee. And we are happy that you join us here today for the simple reason that you are also involved, not in the new convention, but in the famous conference on the future of Europe. So why have we chosen this topic? Well, Sometimes it is necessary that we come back also to the basis and basics of social democracy, because we hear in the public debate, not only in the media debate and in the bubbles, that you cannot identify anymore what social democracy stands for. And therefore, the question of a social, a truly social democratic program, which is focused on social rights, on the material well-being and well-being more than a feeling, and democratic participation, not only in Europe, but also outside of Europe, is a reference for us. The point is, we not only have to debate what should be the ingredients of such a program, of such a reference, but we have also to connect with the citizens, not with the voters, but with the citizens, and to anchor, again, our values within society. Because we see all over Europe, not only in authoritarian regimes, but also in other countries, that, well, the... The couple of social progress and democracy is broken in the sense that people also think you can have social progress and material well-being without democracy. And therefore, I think it's important that as social democrats and socialists and progressives worldwide, we understand that we need to fight also that these values that we stand for, that we want to represent and that we want to promote, that they are really anchored within our societies. So this project cannot only be European. I think all of us are convinced of this. Therefore, as Progressive Alliance and also you in your different responsibility with an international outreach, we know that we often have this debate and say, yeah, the European social model is only for Europe. No, it is not. And we will discuss this later. And I think we all also witnessed in the last months a very positive surprise, in particular coming from the United States, where with the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, 
we see that things we have been discussing long years ago already when you were commissioner, the question of social investment in public health and care services uh, in public good uh, is now an agenda of the president of the portals of the president and the new administration in the United States. So an inspiring uh, progressive program. We have also been seeing and witnessing over the last decades some progress in Latin America, in Africa, and also in Asia. And nevertheless, we must say that this is, has not, we have not reached at the level that it could be considered being sustainable. So the fight is still going on. And therefore, we need this large alliance between political parties, progressive political parties, trade union movement, and progressive civil society to defend and to promote the social acquis because times are not always looking very good. And sometimes we see really not only a social backlash, but also we assist uh, to some societal backlash. The question of the rights of minorities, of the LGBTI community, of other minorities, of migrants are under threat. So I think it is time that we come back to say this is what we stand for and this is what we want to fight for. And this is why the question of welfare which is not a luxury model that you can afford in good times of economic growth, but which is a reference. Welfare and democracy is the couple which you cannot divide in anything. And therefore, we want to discuss this around this table, which for some of us is a new experience after, well, let's say 15 months of confinement and pandemia. But it is good. And therefore, the idea is that we will not only have statements and then questions and answers. The point is that we really want to have a lively debate. And it's my pleasure also to welcome now at this moment Nicola Schmidt, the European Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights. I will not repeat my speech, but welcome to you. And uh, well, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, we, well, let's say we all know each other, which can be an advantage and not an inconvenient. But let's say, nevertheless, the idea is that we have a very, very open debate. And let me say, as Nicola is arriving, um, well, we see the difference. We see the difference uh, when we have progressives in the seat, uh, like Laszlo at the time and Nicola now and others, so that we can really understand that progressives can make the difference being in governmental responsibility at the national, regional, local level or at European level. So my proposal is that we start with the discussion and the first, uh, let's say, the input would come from Laszlo Andor, the Secretary General of the Foundation of European Progressive Studies. Laszlo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, dear Connie, dear friends, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. I believe um, a discussion on welfare and democracy in a global perspective is very timely. And I would like to um, highlight a few reasons of uh, why I consider this a very timely uh, discussion. And uh, I look forward to uh, the roundtable um, after uh, this introduction. Where should I start? I believe I'm obliged to start with Willy Brandt. Um, having arrived to Willy Brandt Airport in itself is a great experience after uh, so much uh, you know, waiting. Uh, but in Willy Brandt House, um, uh, I would like to recall um, a very important book which he wrote when he was not anymore a chancellor uh, of uh, Germany. As we know, when he was a chancellor, he worked a lot on Eastern policy of Germany. But after he was a chancellor, he worked on the southern policy, the north-south uh, questions. And a book which at that time, in the 1980s, was already published um, uh, to Hung in Hungarian. Uh, so I managed to read it when I was a student. Uh, it was called in German, Der Organisierte Wahnsinn, uh, Weltristen und Welthunger. Um, in English, the title is Organized Madness. And um, it was also well translated uh, to Hungarian language. And it basically sent uh, a message uh, about the world as a whole spending a huge amount of money on arms um, in the period of the arms race, uh, when the same amount could also be spent on food and social services uh, people around the world uh, actually need. And he was not only a champion of uh, the theory of this and, uh, you know, working out uh, uh, some ideas, but also to act in the context of the United Nations 
and in, in other uh, uh, fora uh, to make um, all uh, this happen. Now, what has happened since the time of uh, Brandt and uh, uh, the book he published about the organized uh, madness is very interesting um, to look at from a statistical point of view. You can rely on Branko Milanovic, who wrote the book The Worlds Apart, um, uh, to, to help elaborating on how we measure inequality uh, in a global context, but also within societies. And if, if you want to simplify and put it in a, a nutshell, you can say that, okay, global inequality has uh, been reduced because a lot of emerging economies, especially the so-called BRICS, uh, managed to uh, converge economically. But a lot of, uh, in, in, in most cases, inequality within countries has increased. So a, a very uh, a controversial uh, social development, uh, in a way, uh, signaling that economic convergence is possible uh, with good policies and good strategies, but it's in itself it's not sufficient uh, to produce social convergence and the convergence of the social models. By the way, this is also something which we are witnessing inside the European Union, that in an East-West relationship um, uh, inside uh, the EU, there has been, since EU enlargement to the East, a lot of economic convergence, uh, high growth rates in terms of GDP in the West, but there's no guarantee that social rights, workplace conditions would equally uh, develop well uh, in, uh, in, in, in those countries. Now, what is behind this? What we call neoliberalism, a neoliberal paradigm, which, uh, contrary to the expectations of Brandt, became the dominant ideology uh, in the 1990s, based on the so-called Washington uh, Consensus, which was promoting a model of economic development vis-a-vis -vis the Global South, uh, which is based uh, on practically foreign capital import, uh, multinational companies, but also multinational finance, um, and not simply arriving to these countries uh, to provide resources for investment, but also conditioning the entire economic policy, but also social policy. And these conditions, uh, in most cases, were not really supportive of promoting uh, social rights, not supportive of social investment, not supportive of uh, active um, employment uh, uh, policies. Now, luckily, the Washington Consensus was not the end of history. So I think the, 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 the 1990s already showed many failures of uh, the Washington consensus uh, paradigm. So in a way, the, the world has uh, moved on. The institutions that promoted it uh, have also adjusted their ideology. If you look at the World Bank, uh, they say it's about poverty reduction. Right? So the, now the World Bank also says, our dream is a world without poverty. If you enter the building in Washington, they say that's what you can uh, read. The International Monetary Fund, very <laughs> Yeah, should it's, it's, don't, don't worry, all okay. fine. The International Monetary Fund, very counterintuitive, uh, started to speak um, about the importance of tackling inequality uh, since uh, 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 probably uh, Dominic strauss and more importantly since Christine Lagarde, who also highlights the importance of gender uh, equality uh, on the agenda of multilateral uh, institutions. Um, I would say that the Bretton Woods institutions are still on probation from this uh, point of view. Uh, so it's still a kind of test period uh, from the point of view of you know, being really committed to a different uh, economic paradigm. We have seen the International Monetary Fund in a very controversial role also inside the Eurozone crisis a few years ago. Um, so uh, let's shift the focus to the ILO. Because I think the ILO, which is 100 years old, is really a kind of bastion uh, to promote uh, social rights and industrial relations um, around uh, the world. And again, if you uh, go to the ILO for the statistics, they would monitor uh, the development of social rights in four key areas. Minimum wage, whether workers are covered or not by minimum wage. Maximum weekly hours of work, which is also measurable in most cases occupational health and safety uh, standards, and maternity leave, 
whether uh, women have the right, uh, first of all, but you know, more broadly, also, of course, uh, parentally, but let's just focus on maternity uh, leave at the first approach. So the, I, the ILO would say to you that uh, the minimum wage in one form or another exists in more than 90% of the member states of uh, the ILO, which is a relatively high number and displays kind of uh, social progress uh, to similar uh, directions uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the world, at least at the level of the concept. And only about 8% of the member states of the ILO has no upper limit of the weekly working hours. Again, let's call it a good result, right? So we, let's also work on the 8%, but it's good that it's over 90%, which has an upper limit on uh, the weekly working hours. And uh, cases like uh, the very unfortunate uh, collapse of the Rana Plaza building in 2013 triggered also reforms in many countries, not only in Bangladesh itself, about health and safety at the workplace and more, in more generally labor law to boost uh, the possibility to improve uh, uh, health and safety uh, standards. Of course, we know that child labor in many places remains a problem. Of course, we know that gender imbalances um, are great and require constant attention and a fight for equal uh, rights. At the same time, if you look at the so-called BRICS, I think you can also prove that uh, in most cases, there was an important social element coupled with the economic uh, progress. If we start with China, probably you know, the most impressive in terms of uh, economic uh, growth, they extended a kind of minimum income model in cities, which they called the Dibao uh, program. In 2013, they started to reform what they called the Huko system, uh, which uh, kind of uh, differentiated in terms of social rights between city and rural uh, uh, places. Um, in India, they extended school meal programs. Uh, they created in rural areas a kind of employment guarantee model under the name of uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And perhaps the most famous program of all is in Brazil, the so-called Bolsa Familia, which uh, created a kind of transferable model for conditional cash transfers and uh, allowed for uh, uh, a, a major anti-poverty program. Uh, which at that time of President Lula was indeed very successful. Now, um, the World Bank uh, was not uh, shy to proclaim that you know, this is indeed a period of extending uh, social safety nets, and they suggested that uh, every year uh, the number of people covered by some form of social safety net was increasing by about 9%. So altogether, uh, now we would say that about 1 billion people in the world receive some kind of social benefit at uh, one time. However, what we need to stress is that this is not simply, and of course not especially, thanks to the World Bank, thanks to the multinational uh, investors, it's, it's basically about the capacity of working people being able to uh, unite and fight for their rights, fight for uh, social progress in those countries, and that's also where uh, uh, the social democratic orientation uh, comes to the picture uh, very, very importantly. To demonstrate this, um, I would like to recommend uh, to everybody a very interesting book, uh, which is called How to Fight Inequality, yeah. Ben Phillips, uh, How to Fight Inequality and Why That Fight Needs You. Also for the camera. Yeah. Um, why is this uh, an interesting book? Because um, in the context of inequality, uh, we all are knowledgeable about Thomas Piketty, who in the, on the basis of the statistics of the advanced uh, uh, industrialized countries, showed that there is an exceptional period, the post-war two and a half decades, when inequality was reduced. And we know that this is pretty much also the period of social democratic progress, uh, when, uh, when uh, welfare states were... Uh, established and uh, social dialogue was allowed to develop deep roots in uh, many countries. And Ben Phillips' book is very interesting because he compares the 2000s, 10, 15 years after 2000 in Latin America to this period of post-war Western Europe and 
post-war uh, Europe in general and North America, um, in a way, a kind of exceptional decade, but highlighting that the reduction of inequality was only possible, was only possible because what we believe social, uh, you know, social rights and, and how it is organized uh, was allowed to progress. And, uh, you know, programs which I highlighted, Borsa Familia, played an important role in poverty reduction. But in terms of reducing inequality, it would not have happened without wages uh, uh, growing uh, based on an improved bargaining power of labor, thanks to unionization and more institutional forms of uh, wage uh, setting. Also, in developing context, land reform, allowing the peasantry to own and uh, make uh, progress and enhancing uh, social services in various forms, including access to public health care, which uh, Connie mentioned in the introduction. Now, this, I believe, is important because we looked at Latin America, especially in the 1980s, at the time of Brand's book, uh, as a region of democratization. But a lot of people didn't pay attention to the question of the sustainability of these democratic transitions. And I would like to argue that the only way to make these democratizations, democratic transitions sustainable and resilient is to continue the process with social progress. Because that's why people fight for democracy. That's why people fight for the right to vote. That's why people fight for being able to elect the leaders of the country to counterbalance economic power with the political power and being able to establish re redistributive uh, 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 structures uh, in um, uh, the scholarly literature. I think it is well documented that the return to democracy in those countries of the global south, especially in the Latin American experience, increases what they call the redistributive pressures and results in various forms of uh, safety uh, uh, nets. Of course, the resilience of those is an important question. Now, um, I would not uh, like to end without mentioning something which is very important in my view, that although we focus on the global south in the global perspective, but perhaps the most important development is taking place not in the global south, or not strictly speaking the global south, but the United States of America. Uh, because in the transatlantic uh, relation, um, there has been a lot of talk and um, analysis about you know, the competition of capitalist models. And um, we have experienced not a small amount of arrogance about you know, Europe being very old and old fashioned and uh, you know, diminishing in terms of uh, uh, the, the presence of the post-war structures of uh, uh, neocorporatism practically. And, uh, and social security, which is based on you know, a high level of redistribution and taxation in certain countries, and the, the power and um, uh, the, 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 the energy of uh, the Anglo-Saxon model was uh, pretty much uh, what we heard from economic science, or at least from economic uh, doctrines. Now, what we experience, on the other hand, in recent years, with or without the crisis of uh, the last 15 uh, years, is that the United States eventually decided to have some kind of health insurance in the Obamacare, uh, in the form of the Obamacare. Um, and uh, now with uh, uh, the Joe Biden administration, with a massive um, financial commitment to investment, they also developed a new concept of reduction of child poverty with the aim of the recovery program to halve child poverty in uh, the United uh, States and empower labor. So in a way, put an end to Reaganism, uh, which had, from the very start in the early 1980s, uh, destroyed the power of uh, the trade unions and opened the long, long uh, period of wage stagnation in uh, the United States. So, some, uh, states, so somehow, um, you know, put together a more complex package, which in Europe we would call a social democratic one. Uh, obviously, we cannot expect uh, uh, in the United States to you know, have quickly a social democratic party to lead this, but the social democratic philosophy becoming stronger 
in the Democratic Party, I would argue, is uh, very obvious. Going back to the examples, because there's always a need for an example from national history, the 1930s and the New Deal of the Roosevelt administration, which created social security, unemployment insurance, uh, and various policies of employment. So all in all, um, I think uh, the notion which you sometimes mean that social democracy is something which is essentially European, and because Europe is shrinking in the world, the relevance of social democracy is also you know, eroding in the world. I would argue the contrary. I would say that all these developments which I highlighted, progress with democracy, but at the same time progress uh, with uh, uh, the effort to couple economic development with social progress and the, the upgrading of uh, social models is something which proves uh, the relevance of uh, uh, the social democracy pro uh, program in uh, the global south or in general uh, uh, more, 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 more globally. And uh, of course we have to uh, oh. discuss the causes of fragility in the US, but also elsewhere, of democratic structures. And the fragility of uh, uh, social uh, programs uh, and the connection between the two. Uh, but this is a, a relevant question and, uh, and, uh, and the relevant program uh, for us uh, to discuss and work on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laszlo. That was well. <laughs> Excellent. Well, excellent contribution and certainly a lot of food of thought. And well, we have time to, to exchange on this. And uh, well, let me come back on two or three ideas I mentioned. First of all, the reference to Willy Brandt. Well, um, I'm from a generation when the voting age was put down to 18 years. I could vote uh, in 72, so you know how old I'm. And the, the fascinating uh, campaign that Willy Brandt was leading at that time, the leitmotif of that campaign was there more democracy, mehr Demokratie wagen, mehr Demokratie wagen, there more democracy. And I think this is really, it is joins exactly what you were saying. There is not the possibility of thinking and looking only to economic growth yeah, and the famous indicators, but really to understand fighting inequality goes in hand in hand with promoting democracy. And there is not a, a sustainable pos uh, development possible without also a sustainable democracy. And as I said in the opening, well, we know also inside of Europe, but also outside of Europe, that democracy has become under threat. Um, and also that there is some kind of sometimes what we call democracy fatigue. You were mentioning, well, the, well in a way, during a time, the victory of the neoliberal paradigm, which ended up in particular after the crisis of 2008 with the famous austerity policies where somebody said uh, there is no austerity policies, only reasonable policies, but we know on the economic and social disasters of these austerity policies. But perhaps also, well, if I may say something which we also as social democrats should not forget, what was also the negative role, the famous orientation to the third way uh, in our political family played at that time. So I think we should not forget how this influence also uh, in the way of political family. But indeed, there is something uh, which is more than signs of hope. There are changes within the international institutions, which is important. There are changes on different continents where we see progress. Uh, well, in some continents, you were mentioning Latin America. We saw from uh, October 2019 on a lot of social unrest in Chile, which has led now to a new constitutional assembly, and we may have very progressive and positive change and to get rid of the constitution of the dictatorship. We actually assist also to social unrest in Colombia. And we, we see that very positive policies that were run by progressive governments like in Brazil under Lula and also in, uh, in Uruguay by Frente Amplio uh, with the political change and uh, the right wing coming back to power. What do they attack is in exactly the social key and all these policies uh, which have at least put people out of poverty and which had rehabilitated the social investment in public and public goods and social welfare. 
Well, for Latin America, we should not forget that there were also the dark years of the dictatorships, not only Chile, yeah, but we had Argentina, we had Uruguay, and we know in particular also that we have many parts of uh, the continent which are really in difficult situations also, well, with Maduro in Venezuela, uh, Colombia, I already mentioned, and we saw the difficulties in Peru. So, Willy Brandt is the reference, yeah? Because he said, nichts ist für immer, nichts ist von Dauer, man muss immer dafür kämpfen. Nothing is forever, nothing is for eternity, you always have to fight for it. So this is, I think that's also another leitmotiv of Willy, which could inspire our discussion. I would like now to turn to Commissioner Nicola Schmidt. Thanks again for joining us. You are a very busy man, but you have a historical moment behind you, which is the Porto Summit. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that, well, all of us, we have been involved uh, four years ago with the Göteborg uh, Summit, which gave birth to the European Pillar of Social Rights. And my introductory question to you, and for inviting you to react on what are your observations, reaction to what Laszlo said, but would you confirm that there's also a time for, that there is now a momentum for change for progressive policies in Europe, in particular when it comes to social policies and uh, well, fighting inequality uh, with this commission and with the well, the decisions that have been taken uh, in the Porto Summit, or what would be your advice to to build how to build on this uh, at least results that we have for the moment being. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and I think it's very useful to have this kind of discussion now, precisely. And uh, I listen carefully to what uh, Lazo has said and. Uh, I also have the feeling that we are uh, in a period of change of paradigm. If we manage it, if we win this battle, that's still open. I would not say uh, this is already done. And I agree with what you have said uh, uh, about Willy Brandt, because we see there are contradictions all, all over the place. But I think that nevertheless, I, I, I'm coming from a meeting of the G20 uh, in Catania. Uh, of the labor ministers and social affairs ministers of the G20 countries. So a very diverse composition. And uh, what I listened there, what I heard there, is that there is the feeling all over the place, all over the world, that social is important, that you cannot have uh, an efficient economy. Demo democracy is not a chapter, but uh, an efficient economy without social uh, investments. So from all the places you, you feel that, that uh, from Saudi Arabia even, uh, to China, to Singapore, there is this at least a change of discourse in that sense. So this is the positive uh, element. The second one is ideologically speaking, I think that neoliberalism is uh, uh, more on the loser's uh, side. It's not yet done, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I have the feeling that uh, uh, the, the, the discourse, which, which finally uh, was very uh, dominating, even in our own family, uh, this discourse uh, has been weakened. And uh, because of, of the facts, and we know that when, uh, when we are talking about welfare state, the attack against the welfare state uh, from the neoliberals was very harsh. Uh, Hayek, uh, for Hayek, welfare state is the way to... Uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, serve them. So serve them. So this is something very... And this was applied. And I recently read a book on Chile, precisely. And you can just be very surprised that uh, where the neoliberal the theories were really applied up to the, to the last consequence was in Chile. Yes, and Friedman and Hayek, they liked Pinochet and said, well, okay, that might not be the, but it's always better than this socialist thing uh, where uh, finally uh, people are uh, uh, dominated by uh, intervention of the state. And this shows again that um, neoliberalism, the abolishing of the welfare state, is leading to dictatorship, is leading to authoritarianism. And we see it in a way, even the, the problems in the US, the problems in Europe, 
the weakening of the European project, the weakening of democracy in Europe, is the result of uh, the uh, deconstruction of the welfare state, of the social protection, of the idea that the markets have to dominate all our lives. And uh, even uh, I, I, I was shocked by this idea expressed in this country that you have to have a market democracy. You remember who said that? Market com, com, yeah. Market conform democracy. Conform democracy. Yeah. Market conform democracy. So the market is over the democracy. And this shows that uh, there is a lot uh, uh, that has to be uh, rebuilt uh, in that sense. And finally, we did not draw, draw the, the real conclusions of the previous crisis. Perhaps with the pandemic, things might change. But uh, finally, the, the reaction to the financial crisis, which should have really been the moment of saying, well, uh, the facts show that this was an ideology, this was something incredible, which really drove us into the wall. No, this was not the case. We continued, and the policies which were applied were absolutely even reinforcing this same ideology. Okay, now I think uh, we are at the new momentum, partly because of the pandemic, but also partly because uh, uh, there are uh, movements all over uh, the world, all over our societies, not all of them positive, but I think there is an awareness that if we just had gone on the same on the same way. Uh, well, Europe, in my in my view, would have been uh, under a heavy threat. Under a heavy threat, it still is, but it would have been under a heavy threat. We saw populist movements everywhere. They are still there. We should not be uh, naive. They are still there. But uh, there was a moment uh, where we really felt after the last crisis that. Uh, well, there could have been a return to very nationalistic policies, uh, putting into question uh, also uh, uh, the uh, democracies in Europe, or at least we see it in some countries, uh, be it Poland, be it Hungary, more in, uh, uh, but also Italy is a very fragile uh, democracy. Nobody knows if the extreme right comes to power. In France, we see now after the last election, okay, we might be optimistic, but nevertheless, our, our democracies are much, uh, have, have been weakened. Now, what, what can happen and what should happen? Now, I think uh, uh, this commission, thanks to our political family, we have to say that, Thanks to the pressure of our political family and to the uh, rapport de force we could establish in the uh, European Parliament for the votes, uh, we got a program which is a rather progressive program. Building on something my compatriot had launched and we had all been a bit uh, suspicious saying, well, this is again this kind of declaration and so on, the pillar of social rights. But what is interest, interesting, afterwards one, one is always a, a bit more intelligent, what is interesting with the pillar of social rights, these are very concrete rights. Mm -hmm. These are not abstract things. These are not, well, we are for justice or we are, for, it's quite concrete. We know what education means, the right and the access to education. When we say everybody should have a right to have a decent wage, a decent minimum wage, collective bargaining, these are very concrete things. You can use and you can really transform into concrete policies. But I say, well, you have to build a just uh, society. Well, that's what the Chinese also say, uh, in a way. So you, we, here we have an instrument. And it is really a big chance that we could save this pillar of social rights because that was not obvious. That could have gone differently. That this commission would have said, okay, that was um, this guy Juncker, a bit crazy. Uh, we, we do something different. Mm -hmm. But we could save the pillar of social rights. And we said what our family had said before, what the unions had said before, well, now we transform this into concrete policies, which was 
easier because it was already relatively concrete. Certainly it's principles, but relative concrete principles. And that's what we have done by uh, uh, proposing this uh, action plan on, on the pillar of social rights, which is not perfect, which is also a compromise. A compromise within the Commission, a compromise uh, uh, with the member states, but it gives a certain number of important uh, elements. And this is for me, uh, and this is also in, by the way, in the pillar. How do we rebuild a strong European welfare state in a changing economic, technological, and global environment? And I think that. Uh, uh, what what uh, you have said, Connie, on the third way or third way, they uh, they tried that too because they thought globalization that's ideal, that's fantastic, that's great, and uh, we all will be richer. And Lazo has now shown, and uh, on the basis of uh, the elephant, <laughs> that, that's uh, what he, the the elef famous elephant elephant is that this didn't happen. The losers were the big losers. And there were a few big winners, even if at the global level, poverty had, had gone down, inequality had gone down, but in the societies, even in the South, inequalities have very often gone up. Look at China, very rich people, but also certainly in the emergency of a, a, a middle class, that's what, uh, what is his name, Mil uh, Milan Milanovic. Milanovic has said, but uh, also... Uh, an, an important number of people who have not managed to, to get out of poverty. Now, uh, in Europe, I think we, we, we plan now, just to tell you, uh, to start this reflection on uh, what is the welfare state uh, of the future, given technology, given the risks in the labor market. We are talking about platforms, precariousness. These are the realities. These are the contradiction of, the, of a welfare state that works for everybody. And uh, that's something we, we, we launch now, uh, a reflection here on, on technology and on climate, because the, the, the climate issue, the environmental issue, is also a very important issue in this aspect. And I think democracy. But democracy in a way that is not just uh, our political democracy as we understand it, because the problem of democracy is what can we do about democratizing the economy? This is a, a chapter which has been entirely put aside. Nobody dares too much taking that up again. But we know that if we want to have the challenge, to face the challenges of transforming our economy uh, because of climate, because of technology, and to have a human-centered approach, especially also in the context of new technologies, we have to really restore democracy or more democracy in, 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 in companies, in the way how we uh, manage our, our economy. So, and this is not just, this is power, this is bargaining power, this is also uh, a, a new kind of negotiation, well, uh, reviving or taking what exists, hopefully we're still in Germany and uh, in some other countries, and uh, trying to, to rebuild this model also uh, in Europe and over Europe, because even in the US, people are discussing this now mm -hmm. uh, about uh, uh, the share of power, not just at the political level, but especially also at the economic level. And I think now uh, this is a momentum. Porto was a, a good moment. Uh, not everything was uh, achieved in Porto, but it was at least a good moment. And here, I think, the legacy or the uh, legitimacy of the welfare state, well, unfortunately, it's the pandemic which has underlined this. Mm -hmm. Because everybody understood if you do not have a good health system, if you do not have a good care system, if you do not have some kind of OSH uh, rules, well, uh, your whole sy system collapse, collapses. And therefore, it is uh, now the moment for our uh, political forces with others, maybe, and hopefully, to rebuild this, uh, uh, this uh, paradigm, to rebuild this uh, approach, uh, to strengthen the welfare systems, showing that the social and the economic are not separated. They are the two sides of the same coin. And I think this is what we try in the Commission to do. And 
at all occasions. We say, whatever the file we have, we try to introduce the pillar of social rights. Sometimes we say, oh, again, we have, we have to do it because social wars, and, and Laszlo knows it, he was a commissioner in difficult times, I think. Uh, well, social wars, something apart. Well, you also had to do a bit of social. But we say, no, social is part of the whole. Social has to be part of all the policies. We have to integrate. That was a big fight. We didn't win it entirely, but thanks to the European Parliament, we managed it with a recovery to introduce, nevertheless, the social dimension in the recovery because there was a strong opposition by the uh, Orthodox in the Commission uh, to keep social out. We have managed at least to, to have the window uh, uh, open and this is what we have to rebuild. And what is at stake, in my view, is the future of Europe. If we do not really show that this uh, European project is a project for citizens, is a project for social security, for social protection, for better living conditions, for better working conditions, we will uh, face difficult moments, including uh, uh, in, in the sense of uh, the stability of our democracies. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nicola. And thank you to, well, to, really to point out that there is a window of opportunity, yeah, but it is not given. We have to fight for it and to, to see how that we well, consolidate this key that we have now. I think indeed, uh, well, if there's a paradigm change possible, certainly this did not fall from heaven. Um, but it is linked to the fact, indeed, that the pandemic has accelerated to thinking that what we had to defend before and always to argue difficultly before that public is a, uh, that health is a public good, access to health care and social services, to, so, to bargaining and so on, is part of a, of a social model, or not only European social model. This has now become evident in the times of crisis because also the versions have raised. The, the, hopefully, yeah, that when we get out of this pandemic, this awareness remains, and therefore we have to keep it uh, to keep fire in the movement, uh, in the way that well, to make really to make now the progress concrete. I agree what you are saying. The pillar of social rights was a set of rights in the very beginning, and some were very doubtful how it, can this be concrete. On the other hand. We have not only the employment side, we have the education, we have homelessness, child care and so on. It is very rich and well, now get, seeing that it can be uh, concretized, I think this is something which is very encouraging. You were mentioning the question of the, well, the shift of power relations and the impact of the political family. I also think observing what is going on in Brussels in the European Parliament in the Commission with the recovery plan, well, that there is a really change compared to, to former times. So if there's a new momentum, how can we, well, really continue to work on it and understand what we have been arguing for long years, that economy and the social development cannot be decoupled. It goes together. And with the pillar now, there is something at least in our hands. And I think what I know also from other continents they observe what we do in Europe and what is going on in Europe. And therefore, I think, yes, indeed, we have to come back to a very essential question, which is democracy not only as an institutional system, not only as the question of participatory democracy in societal questions, which is a topic of civil society often, but in particular also when to get to the question of economic power and also the, the question of well, more democracy in the, at the level of companies and uh, in the world of, uh, of the big business. So this is a good bridge builder because now I can give the floor to, to Esther and would like you to, well, to, to make your observations from the European Trade Union Confederation side. But I see you are smiling. So yeah, you are I'm not so only happy to see you. <laughs> and not only happy to see us here, but also that we have a yeah. good discussion. So the floor is yours, Esther. Sure. When I woke up this morning, I had this half-remembered quote from my teenage years rolling around in my head and it was a Shakespeare because part of our education was to learn um, some Shakespeare and I had to google it uh, so and I've and I've written it down so it's it's from Julius Caesar and it says there's a tide in the affairs of men and women which taken at the flood leads to fortune omitted all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and miseries and on such a full sea are we now afloat. 
I just thought that really captured the um, discussion we, we were going to have today, which is what's the full C and how do we capture this tide of hope? And mm. I'd like to put four ideas on the table. The first of those is, as everybody has said, it's that it's so important for progressive forces to mobilise that hope. Because I think all of those authoritarian and regressive forces think we can't do it. They're banking on us not being able to do it. They're banking on uh, working people and their families and communities giving up hope of change, giving up hope that democracy will deliver the type of change that they want to see for themselves and giving up hope that the European Union is the place that can help them in that struggle. So I think it's, that's the first thing is to say absolutely we need a, a very specific and deliberate plan. The second idea I have on that is, relates to the discussion that we're having on the conference on the future of Europe. And, that, and that's really a discussion about the, the purpose of the European Union. And there's always been a piece in the treaty which sets out the instructions for Europe that talks about the social market economy. Now, the market economy got a whole load of interest and a whole load of uh, uh, action in that, and less so the social. And I was wondering whether making the achievement of the, of the rights in the European pillar of social rights, the purpose of the social market economy, might be a very good way of communicating what we're actually talking about. What we would be changing by doing that is to say that the purpose of the European Union isn't the protection of the euro, which some people began to believe during the um, uh, financial crisis, but the purpose of the European Union is the achievement of the rights within the European pillar of social rights, whether it's by delivering it through law or whether it's by delivering it through the focus of the spend. Uh, and, so, so it's, and so I do think that there's a way to communicate and to be able to guarantee the delivery of the European Pillar of Social Rights in a, in a number of the discussions that we're having. The second uh, idea I'd like to put on the table for discussion is the need to rein in company excess and to get into the boardrooms and to change the way in which CEOs are making their decisions and to change the way in which uh, boards are making their decisions. And chief among those is, of course, making sure that workers uh, have a representation on the boards, also that women have representation on boards, but also we need to look at the purpose of the companies. That it, it, it's not good enough that companies get all the benefits of the social market economy and then literally have get-out-of-jail-free cards for, uh, for the way in which the company uh, is operating, whether it's... Uh, entirely rejecting the idea that, that workers are indeed employees and instead pretending they're self-employed as a way to get over paying their taxes or paying their, their, their social contributions or indeed even up to their health and safety responsibilities, but also in terms of their corporate citizenship. Um, so I think that if companies are going to get all of the benefit of the social market economy, we need to hold them to account in a very real way that they're actually paying, paying their way and being held to account in the way that every minimum wage worker, every day they go to, to work, is held to account and made to pay their way, both in terms of their labour, but also in terms of their taxes. There's no, there's no special tax provision for minimum wage workers. So we have to hold companies uh, to account in... Uh, in a, in, a, in a more effective uh, and transparent and visible way. Uh, importantly, that means uh, making sure, for example, the action plan under the European Pillar of Social Rights says 60% of workers will get access to training. We need to make sure that companies are giving time to workers for that training, that they're making sure workers get access to their training and that they're not stopping workers their day's pay when they go for that training. So, so we have to make sure that companies are helping to deliver on that action plan. It can't be the case that it's left only up to member states to do that or only up to the Commission to do that. We need to make sure that this major actor, which all too often gets away scot-free, as I said, is held uh, into account, for example, in relation to uh, 
helping workers make the transition, either the green transition or the digital transition. Uh, a way, of course, uh, to, to discuss this is the third idea as well, it is to look at pre-redistribution, which is wages, mm -hmm. to make sure that the collective benefits of collective bargaining are uh, proper, properly available. Uh, increased wages through collective bargaining isn't just a value, of course, to the worker and their family being able to put a roof over their head, food on the table and, and, have, and have some chance of investing in themselves, in their family for the future, or indeed to make savings to, to try and uh, overcome shocks. One of the interesting facts uh, that the, Euro the U European Foundation on Living and Working Conditions mm -hmm. reported was that going into this crisis, one third of workers in Europe had no savings. And the reason they had no savings was because they, they didn't earn enough to put any money by. The other third had savings that could keep them going for around six to eight weeks. So again, not, not, not a big wad of cash sitting in a bank account, like, like barely, barely enough. And I think that that pre-redistribution pre idea needs a much greater focus. And of course, mm -hmm. the, main, the main way, exactly as Laszlo uh, identified, is, is to make sure that, that workers can organise a union and bargain. And I want to thank you, Commissioner Schmidt, for all of the work that you did on trying to make sure that that was within the directive on minimum wages. And we really hope that, the, uh, that, that workers and their unions come out and fight for that directive. And it's really important that, that we get organised and fight for that directive because it's a very real way in which we can make sure that nobody's left behind. A lot of people talking about let's make sure nobody's left behind. But the only way we're going to make sure of that is through the directive on minimum wages because that's going to make sure that the most vulnerable, the people who are most exploited in terms of what they're paid, have a fighting chance to be able to get uh, that, uh, their, their, their paid justice. I'm going to end then just uh, with some ideas about the idea of rights. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, often forgotten about, uh, spoke very eloquently about this. What, what she said in relation to human rights is that people understand rights in their own lives, in small places close to home, in their workplaces. And if people they hear this grand narrative of rights, and exactly as you're saying, Commissioner, justice, but well, then what they see in their workplace isn't anything remotely like that. What they see is that, they're, they're, is that they have very little dignity at work, being timed when they go to the toilet, being afraid uh, to speak up, being afraid to even turn up as themselves very often. So I think that there's a real importance to make sure that rights are effective in the workplace. And there are lots of ways in which that's going completely wrong at the moment, whether it's the amount of hours that people are having to work because of there, there, there is no effective uh, right to disconnect. And I want to encourage you to keep going uh, in respect of that. Um, I also think uh, we were looking, I'm actually on the W20, which is the group uh, of women and we're looking at two things, which is the human in control principle. So that it's always the case, whether it's artificial intelligence or, ro or robotics, that the human is always at the centre and in control. And finally, this idea about the right to human care, that the future of, of welfare should be that you have the right to be treated and helped by a human, that you shouldn't be left always that it's a robot that's going to come and feed you in your old age. And so I think these, these, these new ideas and to start a, the new ideas about human rights, the human in control principle, the right to human care, I think that also is a way of uh, having the type of progressive vision that Willy Brandt uh, started out the route on. So back to you, Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Well, I don't think that um, there were many times that uh, Shakespeare was quoted in this room. <laughs> at least. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but nevertheless... Uh, so Helmut Schmidt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Helmut Schmidt may be the reference for it, but also in school times, uh, in, in my English lessons, we went to Shakespeare and in particular we had to learn the funeral speech at, uh, for Caesar. And there was this famous phrase, we come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Um, yeah. And the good is often interviewed with the bombs. 
and all these questions. But we speak on the good shall not be interpreted with the bones of the European social model, but uh, we, we are not in a funeral service, but we see that there's light in the tunnel and that there is hope. And I think it's very good that you focus in the very beginning. It's important that people have hope uh, because if they do not have hope, in progress for them, for their children, and in better times, and at least in the, in the way of protection, they will also definitively, and we see it in many countries, they turn away from our classical democracy model, which is evident. And yeah, you were mentioning the social market economy. Uh, in this country, in Germany, it is very much linked to a Christian Democratic Chancellor, Ludwig Erhard, but it was not his own uh, intellectual property and ownership. And sometimes it's forgotten how much also the social democrats in the post-war times contributed to it. And indeed, this is just the opposite of a market conform democracy. And like a former party leader of SPD, Sigmar Gabriel said, what we need is not market conform democracy, but democracy conform markets. And I think this brings it absolutely to the point. Um, the question of um, yeah, where we see now the, well, get to, into the boardrooms. Yes, I think this would really make a change. Uh, there is always a debate, and Gabi knows it from DGB's side, the famous German Mitbestimmung, uh, how do you translate it, which is not only the question of uh, how to translate it into other languages, but how to translate the concept and how to make it relevant also outside of one country of the European Union and outside of Europe also. I think it's important that we come back and let's start already with the question of, of accountability. And, and the decisions which are taken, and let's see also uh, what it means. What what is the purpose of companies? Yeah. We know the famous reference, which is, and we saw it in particular after two thousand eight. Yeah, the profit is private, yeah, and the debt is public. Yeah. And I think, therefore, also, and we saw it also in the development of the vaccines, where we had to remind, yes, there are private companies who have developed these new vaccines, but on the other side, they wouldn't have done it without the huge public funding. And therefore, for example, the question of opening the licensing and uh, allowing production of, of vaccines outside of Europe and outside of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, it's just a reality. Yeah? European funding, national state funding, regional funding, which went to these companies, it is just for guessing. Yeah, wages and minimum wages, that's the point. But what I liked very much was that you, and that we do not discuss it often, is the question of savings. Mm -hmm. Many At many opportunities, people tell me and others, uh, there is a problem now uh, on the savings because before the people could save when they could. But now it's not only that you can't because the wage is so low, there is also a problem that then you become under stress by your bank. For example, here in Germany, Commerzbank, uh, which was supported heavily by the, the state in times of crisis after 2008, they bring you now to a negative interest if you have more than 25,000 euros on your bank account. Uh, that means, but what is 25,000 euros? For many people, it's a lot. But on the other side, it's a way, it's a way of protecting the future and, and having part of the safety nets. And I think this should also be a part much more of social democratic policies to think on it because... It's not only hope, it's also the feeling. Yeah, the can, is, is there a way of securing me, at least in times of difficulties? Yes, human-centered, human care. I think, well, we are humanists, we are socialists, social democrats. I think that is it's very good that we, but that we have this in mind, what it is about and what it stands for. Gabi, not the last word, but now we turn to you. And I'm very happy, not only because you uh, well, our parliamentarian, our MEP from SPD in Berlin, uh, with a large background of uh, trade union movement and a lot of experience uh, over 25 years, as I said, in European affairs, in the way of social affairs, I would say. You have been last weekend also to Strasbourg, and in Strasbourg was the first plenary session of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So besides the question, of, is there a paradigm change? Yes. Would you share this positive feeling? But the question would also be from your side is, well, do you see a chance that this conference on the future of Europe would integrate that there's a necessity of a paradigm change, in particular when it comes yeah, to the social key and social progress and to reducing uh, inequalities in the European Union to keep the cohesion high? Uh, because we shouldn't, we know it all, social and territorial cohesion is in the treaty and is the reference, at least, in, is the purpose of the European Union. The floor is yours, Gab. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to discuss here with you. 
And um, as the last speaker here, I have the opportunity to refer to a lot of what you said um, and to try to connect it also a little bit. And I would like to start with an adopted phrase of a US Democrat who said it's the economy stupid many years ago. And I would say to, to paraphrase the times we are in, it's the inequality stupid. Mm. And I think this as a guiding principle also for this conference of Europe is not a bad thing. And I would like to highlight also what Esther said in terms of giving people hope. Is social democracy, is the progressive movement capable of doing so? And if, with which kind of projects? And here I would also like to highlight in the beginning um, what Nicola said. I always said when Juncker started to do this uh, project on the pillar of social rights, I always said, imagine the European house and the declaration of the pillar is just the door opener. It is just again opening this door of a social Europe. It's, it was not more, but it was not less because this door was closed. It was barricaded over the last years and the commissions. And it was up to social democracy and the Porto summit to get the agreement. We want to re renovate this house and we need to renovate it. And we just need not social Europe just to have nicer curtains. We need to change economic policies, we need to change tax policies, we need to change also the uh, elephant in the room, and this is the common market policies. And if we don't do so, um, then it will be just in the end that we open the door and we had the declaration to renovate. But I also say it's this momentum and we used it to do so. And I think without the Portuguese presidency, this would not end our commissioner. This would not have been possible. Sorry, I'm, I'm in this policy field for such a long time. It needed these things uh, to come together and also a strong parliament that pushed a lot that the von der Leyen commission did not put aside the social pillar again, because I also see there was a high risk that this would have happened. And to say, okay, this is from the former president, uh, let's start on something new. And I think with this conference on the future of Europe, we really have a possibility what Andor called, um, if you look at the sustainability of democratic transitions, that we will only do this with social progress. And to link the question of inequality to the fragility of democracies that we are in in these times. And I would like to refer to a very interesting study that Professor Keding did uh, from the University of Duisburg-Essen. And I, I really recommend to read it because he looked not only at the last European elections, but also national and regional elections. And his findings are very, very important because he referred to, he, he looked, for example, at the big European cities, Amsterdam, Berlin, London, Vienna, Prague. And what he did find out is that the participation rate is very, very different depending in what quarter of the city you live in. Is it a wealthy one or a poor one? And, and he addressed this question not only of equal rights, but of equal voice, and that we are the only political movement that can address it. So if you look at Amsterdam, it's where the highest difference is. At the last European elections, but also in Amsterdam, the national and regional are similar. But if you look at the European elections, the difference between the participation rate between the wealthiest areas where you have the highest participation rate and the lowest is 60%. But in all other European cities, it's around 20%. <clears throat> this is something that we really need to address and no one else except us will do that. And also to see if we will have another social democratic area will depend also very much on this. And this also transfers to the level of participatory democracy. 
because what we also see is the fact that if you have given up hope, as Esther said, that to participate in an election will make a difference for your life, people stop doing so. And this threatens the legitimacy also of democracy. And this is an aspect, in my view, that we need to address also in this conference. This was also one reason, you know, I was in the um, working group that prepared the resolution of the parliament um, for the Conference on the Future of Europe and developed this concept. I said, if we have the citizens' participation, we need to make sure that the social economic background is one of the key elements. Because otherwise, if you have this randomly selected citizens, uh, if you don't make sure that also these people that feel disconnected and that feel that whatever they do, it will not make a difference, we have to include them, we have to listen to them. And we really have to see if this is possible. It's an experiment we will see, but I think this is a step forward. And I'm very happy also that Nicolas brought in this question of democracy at work. Mm. Because what we see in, in, in quite a lot of studies is the same element as I referred to the study of Keding, is where people experience that their voice makes a difference and that they can shape, that they can have influence and shape their lives. The trust in democracy is much higher than in societies where this is not the case. And I think this is something that we should take more serious. And I agree. I mean, we had the same debate like with Esping Anderson on the worlds of, of, of welfare. We also have worlds of, of participation of workers, but this key element that you have the influence at the site where you work and that you can express collective interest is important. This morning I was just listening to a radio station about the strike of the nurses in Denmark and saying, listen, we, we had enough of your promises and of your clapping hands and all of this. And even the employers offered 5% more. They said, listen, our work is so undervalued that we, not, we, we need more change. And I think this is for me the key point. Will we go back to the old normal with some decorations, some little improvements? Or will we really change the pattern of this kind of capitalism? And I was thinking, I mean, Honet said in... Uh, I don't know if the English translation will be um, will be appropriate. The the sort of neoliberal disinhabited capitalism. It's not enough if we have a neoliberal, more sustainable uh, capitalism. We really need to address this. And here, I think this question of workers' voice, and this takes on board that we have different ways of participation, but we need a sort of also in Europe minimum standards for this like we do in all other areas of policies, I think will be very important and to see also in the action plan that is important uh, how to include it. I will present next week for the first time an initiative report on this and we will see if this is a debate that will also gain momentum again, if it's done and embedded in this debate on sustainability Sustainable societies, sustainable economies, and sustainable, you cannot have a sustainable economy without workers' voice. It's not possible. And we can see that the new models we have, uh, if, if we look uh, at platform economy and everywhere, they are building the, the, the new world without this aspect totally. It's totally unsustainable in social terms, in, in other terms. And this is I think this is our opportunity. If we don't use this opportunity, we will be gone in 10 or 15 years or we'll, we'll be marginalized. But we have this opportunity to give people hope again and not by nice speeches, but by a commission that delivers. And therefore, for me, the ultimate test are two things. How will the minimum wage proposal progress? Will there be a strong alliance that is more than social democrats and uh, and social and trade unions and social organizations. And the other is with the recovery plans, will we be able 
to really do them different in the semester. And the last test is 2023. If we go back to the stability, stability. and growth back like it was, that was it. That's a test. So we have a lot of opportunities, but a lot of challenges. I think the, the conference on the future of Europe can make a difference, but only if we are able to transfer it from this Brussels and Strasbourg bubble down to the living realities. And I will finish with Esther. For me, I was always a dedicated European. I'm a federalist. For me, the purpose of Europe was always to improve the working and living conditions of Europe. And if Europe is capable to show, and the minimum wage will be essential to do that, I have no doubt that Europe will have a future. But if it doesn't and ignores it and goes back to normal, and especially starts to exploit in a more dramatic form than we already have it, people either from the periphery or people, for example, continue to exploit people um, from societies in Europe where income is much lower. If I look at Eastern Europe, Romania, Bulgaria, if we don't stop this also with this, I think we will be lost. So in my view, there's hope, but we have to manage now. We have to do it and bring it down to the ground. Thank you very much, Gabi. Yes, and I did well, it what comes out that uh, policy making has to do also with giving back hope to, to people. And that they, with the hope, there is a question of trust into a system in institutional democracy. But it is much more than only giving voting opportunities. It is very much also the question of connecting uh, with the citizens in well in the parts where they live. We had also what you were questioning to say the relation uh, or correlation between the voting participation uh, depends on the, the neighborhood or the, the, the where you live in, in the city. Um, we saw it also around the famous Brexit, yes. yeah, that this had a huge impact. And but there are two possibilities. If people do not trust in the system, either they, ret they retire, they do not participate in elections. And I think the, the, um, you mentioned the elections in France, uh, the regional elections, 60% of abstention is a nightmare. Uh, but the people do not see the, the reference, what is it good for going for this vote? And this was not a question of pandemic or pandemic conditions. Yeah. And I think, therefore, yes, we also, this is something where I think we also have to reflect and argue and perhaps also use the opportunity of this conference today of the PES to make it clear it is much more than only having messages. Yeah. It is much more than campaigning for messages. It is to understand what is the concern of the people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are some who remember, uh, for example, in the French uh, election campaigns in the 80s, the most risky question to the candidates was which one? What is the cost of the metro ticket? Yeah. Because they did or not know to reply to it. Or yeah. milk. Yeah, or milk. And this is, yeah. But let's say, um, I've said. Some of it would be easy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, done. <laughs> I like very much that you also brought it back, well, to a systemic question, yeah? because, well, social democracy is, uh, is a particular progressive movement, but we should not be shy and not only dare more democracy, we should also dare more open debate on the question, what are the effects of a, a system, yeah, which is a capitalist system? Yeah? And the question of redistribution of wealth, the question of participatory democracy comes back on the agenda, and we have to... We have to, well, to put it back and not be shy, because if not, we lose soul and we lose the possibility to represent an alternative to people, to the citizens who, who vote and who understand that there is a possibility in this political family to make a change. We have still some 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. Laszlo, after the reactions of the colleagues, yes. not your wrapping up, but your reactions, and then a last short round with this last uh, stating, uh, closing statement, because we should end at half past 12 sharp. And yeah, Laszlo, up uh, to you. <coughs> thank you, Connie. Uh, I would like to use the second round um, to highlight that the Foundation for European Progressive Studies is indeed working very hard on a number of issues, which have been mentioned in the discussion. Uh, if we look at uh, the question of how to strengthen uh, the social dimension of the European Union in a credible way, uh, this afternoon in the conference we are going to contribute to a panel on child union, 
which is very important because the European Parliament in the recent years was very keen to promote the idea of the child guarantee. And uh, FEPS has been helping to develop uh, the appropriate uh, content. And in the recent Progressive Yearbook, uh, also a very important chapter uh, alongside Gabby's chapter on the future of Europe conference uh, was published also to promote uh, uh, child policy, uh, which you know historically is not so much an EU matter. On the other hand, exactly because we saw that in the recent crisis, um, welfare uh, systems uh, were either lacking in, in certain countries or um, uh, inappropriately uh, treated and adjustment policies hit where they shouldn't have hit uh, to provide guarantees and help spreading good models um, also for the sake of uh, uh, gender equality and women's better access to uh, uh, the labor market on the one hand, but also quality care services. Um, so this is a, a very important comprehensive uh, uh, strategy in my view, but we also uh, have started to work on uh, the health union with the involvement of the previous uh, health commissioner, uh, Andrew Kaitis, uh, to promote uh, uh, all this on minimum wage. I just uh, can only agree that this is a crucial one if there is a way uh, to help this campaign to convince the reluctant uh, 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 member states and um, uh, the reluctant state stakeholders that this is an all European interest uh, to, to deliver uh, good uh, minimum standards, not only in terms of wage levels, but also the way the minimum wage is set in certain countries. Um, we are obviously trying to contribute. All this also appears in a new book which was edited by Maria Joel Rodriguez as a contribution of FEPS to the Conference on the Future of uh, Europe. Um, and um, uh, this is also going to be disseminated, but also can be found on the FEPS uh, website, downloadable for free, with a very, very strong uh, chapter on the vision of a social union, practically, which in the long term uh, should be uh, a social democratic program. Thank you, Laszlo. Thank you. Peter. Yes, very briefly. Uh, I think first, uh, and that's that's also the purpose of uh, measures like the child uh, child guarantee, as it was with the youth guarantee, as it is now with our platform on homelessness, which we launched. Now, I, this morning, I was in Berlin with the senator uh, to uh, to see some projects on on homelessness. We have to bring Europe uh, down to the people. We have to, to, to show what, what has to be done. It has to be uh, very concrete. And uh, therefore, this, this, uh, uh, this uh, child guarantee is, is something very, very significant and also emotionally important because we have also to use uh, this side of um, positive emotions. Uh, to 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 and and this is very much linked to to uh, to an engaged social job. That's my my first point. The other one, which is key, and that's the battle uh, ahead of us. And uh, and uh, Gabi said it. Uh, that will be the discussion. What kind of governance we will have after the pandemic? What kind of uh, new rules will we get? Will it be the return to the old rules? Or will it be something new uh, which integrates all these new dimensions uh, of, a, of an active welfare state, of investments, uh, uh, Laszlo's uh, theme of uh, social investment, to treat social investments as investments and not just in budgetary terms as expenditures. So this will be the key moment for this commission and for the future of, uh, of Europe. If we just go back... Uh, uh, as some would like to have it, back to the rules, well, we will have uh, difficult times ahead. And this is a, a fight we, as our uh, family, has to, has to fight. Uh, certainly, we always have to make, at the end, uh, com compromises, but the compromises have to be uh, of a certain quality. Otherwise, we will also lose our credibility. Because this is another. And my third point, I, I just want to say it also. I, I'm very surprised, well, with Biden's speech on the importance of unions. Mm. Uh, and I understand it now. Because when you talk about the, these areas where people do not anymore participate in elections, because they are not, they, they are not structured anymore. They may have a job. They, they are not unionized. 
they have lost all the hope into the traditional political representation. And this is our problem as social democrats. And this is the problem of the Democrats because they have lost the, in the US the blue collar workers, which went to uh, the populists. Mm -hmm. And this is the biggest danger for democracy. Either people vote because they anyway say nobody is doing something for them. So they just close their eyes and they vote for the most provocative, or they just do not vote. Both things are dangerous for democracy. Thank you, Nicola. Esther. Having started with Shakespeare, I'm now going to quote The Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, the film The Terminator. And there's a great line in it, there's no future but what you make. Uh, so, wow. uh, so uh, <laughs> it, it's, yeah, so, 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 that, and I also want to speak to, because I know my, my son and some of his friends are going to be watching this as well. And, and who you vote for matters. Like it, like it really, really does. And joining a union really matters. And if I look at my own life, but I was elected as a shop steward when I was 21. It was, it was so long ago. The factory I was working in, uh, chips were the size of matchboxes. Like that's how long it goes. That, that's that's how, how, how long ago it was. And at that time, part-time workers couldn't join the union. And if you wanted to go from full-time to part-time work, you had to give up your contract and uh, and take up a whole new, new, new contract as a part-time worker. And in my working life, Part-time work became, um, the protection of part-time workers became a priority for the union. The trade union fought for and won rights for women workers and for atypical and vulnerable workers. That fight now has moved to platform work and, and, and the rights uh, of workers on platforms. And then we took the fight after winning it within the union, we then took it to Europe. And we now had a European directive that protects the rights uh, of part-time workers. And that's where, so, so the struggle, the fight, joining a union, getting together with your workmates, getting together in your communities, putting the issues on the table and then fighting to make sure that they're delivered on is how you do change. Hoping somebody else to deliver it isn't going to deliver it. It's up to each and every person to join a union and to look at how they're voting, to make sure the people, to ask the people who are standing, can you show me what you've done in the past? Can you tell me what you're going to do in the future? And then make your choice wisely. Thank you, Esther. Gabi. I would also take uh, the child guarantee and the youth guarantee. And I think especially in times of pandemic, this question of hope for the younger generation is key. And if they think that Europe is helping or if it's putting up obstacles. And therefore, I would, um, I would recommend also not only to see it from an, a sort of perspective of funds and money to put into it, but really of concepts and to see. We have one big challenge to do. And this is that the societal costs of this pandemic, especially regarding children and young people, is not addressed yet and it's not evaluated, but it will be tremendous. And some studies I saw, especially from children from poor families, how this experience in the pandemic increased fear of the future. And this is something... Um, that we have to address. And I have to say, and here, uh, I'm, I'm really talking from my experience. I am the first in my family that ever did a high school diploma and studied. And it was only because of Willy Brandt. You started with Willy, I will finish with him. And it was that he said, um, he didn't say, say it once, it was a program saying that even the Catholic girl from the countryside should be able to have an academic career or to, to, to sort of do develop in terms of via education. And this was emancipation through um, really education. And this had an impact on the whole society. People start to believe even in the small village I came from, where the destiny of girls was take a medium school career, do a three-year apprenticeship somewhere, work five years, marry, have children, and then you can work part-time or whatever. Even part-time at that time, sorry, uh, was not very usual. And to give 
me and my best friend, uh, another girl from the village, to believe in this hope and to say, and my parents didn't want me to do so. And I said, I want it. I think I can do it. And I wouldn't have thought it if we, I wouldn't have a policy that didn't stay a dry program, but really gave the hope that, yeah, they are also thinking about you. Um, you are not just somewhere. And I think this is, this is what we need to do in a modern version, in a different version. And I think with the program and the elements we have in the pillar, we can do so. But only if you reach out really to the ground that people see it makes a difference. And here I come back to the minimum wage. If people see they have more in their pocket because of a proposal Nicolas Schmidt did, and then Europe can make a difference that you maybe can have savings in the future if there is a crisis and you are not standing with the back to the wall. And if your washing machine crashes down, you don't know what to do because you even don't have the money to, to buy a new one. And I think this is the challenge and the opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your participation. It was a, a nice debate, very encouraging. We will not finish it here. Because as Progressive Alliance, well, we are now very much today, we were focused, starting from the global perspective, we were very much focused on Europe. We were working uh, in the, the last months as Progressive Alliance on the question of uh, resilient democracies, which is in a way the same topic we are discussing here. And we know that while the rest of the world looks very much to Europe, but it's also helpful for us to look to the rest of the world and to see the developments there. There is a window of opportunity. I think this is we agree. We are also convinced that we need that, that we have the ingredients for making the change. We need to look for the majorities. We need to anchor also the principle of hope that change is possible and that social democracy is representing the soul. And sometimes, I, well, there was a time I criticized the social democrats with the, heads, the hanging shoulders because everything is so difficult. Now I would say sometimes we need to be a little bit more combative, uh, much more, not aggressive, but more, much more putting the things on the table and saying this is the choice, this is what we stand for, this is what we need, and this makes the difference. You were saying it, there is a risk to come back to austerity policies. Yeah? We have in Germany a candidate from uh, the Christian Democratic Union who already is saying very clear, yeah, we cannot afford anymore the, to, to spend so much if we will reduce the investment, we have to come back to the golden rule and so on. So I expect from my political... If it were the golden rule, it would be not too bad. Huh? I yeah. think so, at least. <laughs> <laughs> a step but at right least the, the question is open, and therefore I think it is important that we have a committed and uh, yeah, combative political family to work for this change. And I thank you very much. I think we are inspired by all, all our, our personal way, by our personal and political experience and... Uh, but I like very much that we had Shakespeare quotes. I think <laughs> yeah, we can also, we should refer in the way we know. We refer as humanists also to dialectics. We know about Hegel, we know about Kant and Descartes. Uh, and I think we know that the way is not easy, but it's possible. And I think this is a good momentum. And I hope that we continue with this momentum today and tomorrow in the conference. So I will not quote Shakespeare, somebody else. I can quote Jim Morrison. I know what you will do. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. I will quote Jim Morrison from The Doors. And there is a famous song, Break on Through to the Other Side. Nice. And I think Excellent. that's the point now. Let's break on through to the other side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.